Sports, and we're here. It's uh, Tuesday night, and you know what that means. It means I have to do some reading. And uh, we're back with uh, with another episode. Friend of the show, Sean McCarthy's on tonight. Sean McCarthy from uh, the Grub Stakers podcast. How's it going? Uh, it's good. Good to be back. Good to good to talk to you again, Mike. Yeah, same. So, all right. So before we start, how's uh, I got to ask you how's uh, how's quarantine going? Uh, it's all right. I mean, we're in like a one bedroom in Manhattan. Yeah, a little cooped up. We like uh, yeah. we we went away to an Airbnb in Connecticut for like two weeks, and um, some people on the internet got mad at me. But uh, yeah, you know, I will I will kill any number of of old people to keep my wife happy. So. I have yeah, no regrets. Exactly. Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with getting away for a couple of weeks. I think if you're still if you're still fleeing the city, then you know something. If you're not back yet, it's like, what are we doing? You know, right? But it's funny that yeah, when it's... you think about people like leaving the city when this when this happens. Does that mean they did it during nine eleven too? Well, that was, yeah, like, I mean, well, most of them weren't here during 9-11, but a lot of Mm -hmm. people thought the city was never coming back, and, you know, then anthrax and uh, just constant terror attacks. Right. Yeah, that's just a very funny idea to me, like, 9-11 happens, then you're like, I I have to go to my mother's house. (laughs) You know? Um, Cool. Well, speaking of mothers, I was talking to my mother today, and we were talking about... I don't know. I usually try to stay away from politics and stuff, but uh, we did we did start talking about socialism, and then we got into Venezuela, and she started saying that you know people in Venezuela, all the young people, they wanted socialism, and then look what's happening right now. They're starving, and you know people always say this stuff. I mean, people like like my mother. I was thinking I could do a podcast where I just debunk my mother's conversation <laughs> every week. Um, but people like my mother seem to think that there's no there's no involvement uh, from our country, you know, in other parts of the world. Like uh, we have nothing to do with uh, the state that Venezuela is in right now, and uh, and it's also funny because she also she watched the uh, she watched the Jack Ryan show and she really liked it. And oh, uh, with the, yeah, yeah. So what I'd like to talk about today is sort of like. The CIA, um, the CIA's connection to certain uh, uh, right-wing paramilitary groups, and also to to, uh, to drug cartels, because it seems like whenever there's uh, whenever whenever we want to do something in another country, it's beneficial for us to uh, have relationships with these people. Yeah, and I think it's like a worthwhile thing that, you know, a lot of people, maybe they sort of know the outlines, but they don't know in detail. But it's it's worth knowing because I think, you know, if you didn't know what's happened the last 60 or 70 years, you might look at like a country like El Salvador mm-hmm. with all the gang, gang violence and MS-13 and shit. And you right. might think, oh, yeah, this place is fucked up because, you know, those people are savages and they right. just can't take care of them, themselves. And then... You do a bit of research. It's like, yeah, no, the fucking Central Intelligence Agency, you know, was uh, backing up a military government that was committing mass murders and, you know, literally raping and killing nuns. Yeah. So, you know, and and you can take your pick of of a bunch of different countries that are kind of fucked up today. Sure. And I think a lot of people who uh, maybe, you know, make racist or whatever assumptions, in a lot of cases, they just don't know the history. And that, that might change that a bit. And it also it wasn't it wasn't like El Salvadorian nuns that they that they raped and murdered. It was they were white nuns. Right. There's these American nuns, American nuns. four nuns. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the Reagan administration was still sending military aid and uh, protecting the people who killed those nuns. Yeah. I feel like once you start reading this stuff, it's hard to uh it like it can be hard to wrap your I mean, you really have to do a lot of work to to sort of like Except that this is the reality of what our country's been doing and what we do. Look, those weren't no fucking bargain basement El Salvadorian nuns. These were the right. real American things. Right. All right. Right. They looked like our moms. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, well, where do you want to go first? Well, I mean, you can even go back to the beginning because I think it's a pretty interesting story of like the CIA being created like 
It starts with in World War II, you have the OSS is set up in 1942. This is like the World War II spy agency for for the United States. Right. And then in 1947, the CIA is created. Right. But it's it's pretty fascinating to me just how quickly the CIA becomes very powerful. Uh-huh. You know, and to the point where like, I mean, you're called a conspiracy theorist if you say that they like run the government, but... I mean, they clearly are a power broker within the U.S. government sure. um, very rapidly. So, like, you know, they're they're set up in 1947, and then by 1953, the CIA does a coup in Iran. They overthrow the elected government there, uh, mm-hmm. Mossadegh. Mossadegh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the prime minister who wanted to nationalize the oil from the British. And then in 1954, they overthrow the government of, of Guatemala, which would, you know, lead to like 40 some years of repression and then a genocide in the 80s there. Mm-hmm. You know, they overthrow like some leftist or moderately leftist guy who was democratically elected and put in a military dictatorship. Right. So, you know, within like a few years, they're already running U.S. foreign policy. Yeah. And then, you know, and then in, in uh, 1963, they kill John F. Kennedy for being Irish and yeah. and trying to stop them, but that was but why they did it, for right? Being Irish. Mainly for being yes. Irish. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're, they, they're <laughs> jealous. <laughs> right. They took down Joseph McCarthy and slandered him as a drunkard exactly. and a pedophile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Jimmy they Hoffa don't probably like, too, right? Right. They don't like our magic. Yeah. We're uh, <laughs> they we're hate Gaelic Italians. fairy people. Right. They yes. hate Italians as well. It's true. Yeah. No, I like. I was posting on Twitter about how, you know, Irish are people of color and, and some, mm. I got quoted by like, cause you know, there's like, this is the thing about Twitter is once you're on there too long, there's all these huge accounts that are like, just quote tweet you. And then, uh, yeah. and then you just have to like deal with it for like a week. Yeah. But so, so I got quote tweeted by like, there's some guy with 50,000 followers who's like a professional debunker of the Irish or slaves myth mm-hmm. or, you know, the myth that the Irish were slaves. Mm-hmm. So he, qu- he quoted tweeted me and then some friend from high school texted me cause he saw this somehow. Yeah. And he now, was wait, like, let me ask you this. Do you genuinely think yeah. the Irish were slaves or is that just like a, jo- a fun joke thing that you like to say? Uh, no, I mean they were involved in indentured servitude, but that's, that's different from slavery. Right. And you know, I, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like, I guess the Irish are slaves thing is, well, that, because that's what he said. My high school friend, he texted me like, yeah, the Irish are slaves that you're, you're repeating like white nationalist propaganda or something. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, my entire argument is the Irish are people of color. I'm, I'm trying to, this is right. the opposite of white nationalism. I'm trying to have right. Irish solidarity with other people of color, right. you know? Really, the best thing to do in these situations is to double down because it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to look like a coward. And also, it's like these people get off. I, like, I think they get off on, uh, you know, this type of thing. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. The worst thing you can do is apologize, apologize in any scenario. Yeah. Yes. Then they taste a little bit of blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah no, and as we all know, the Irish, uh, there's a long line of Irish people who don't apologize. Uh, you, Shane Gillis. Um, i trying to think of who else. Angela Nagel. Yeah, that I mean, that, that's my new working theory is that like if, you know, what Shane Gillis was a wasp. For? Yeah, she wrote she wrote some like really uncontroversial article about, you know, uh, the Immigrant. left case against. Oh, op- yeah. Open borders, mm-hmm. which like, you know, you can agree or you can disagree, but 80, 90 percent of the country does not support open borders. So it's just something you should be able to engage with without calling somebody a fucking Nazi, you know. Right. Has she been sort but, of kicked that? Because we had her on the show. We should get her back on. Has she been like sort of kicked out of uh, the left? Yeah, I mean, she was subject to a bunch of like bad faith attacks, you know, calling her, like I said, a Nazi or uh, all these other obscure terms like Strausserite or Heron Volk and shit. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, she canceled her Twitter account and um, she still makes appearances, but she's generally not featured uh, by you know magazines on the left or doesn't really go on as many left podcasts anymore just because mm-hmm. you know you get tainted with this reputation as like a racist and in sure. this case it's completely ad- completely ridiculous yeah well I just want to say Angela Nagel you're always welcome on the sit down please reach mm-hmm. out if you want to come by right 
Um, and that's my argument, is this all goes back to Queen Victoria and Oliver Cromwell. It's still the same wasps canceling mm-hmm. Irish people when they uh, they shine too, mu- too right. much. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. All right, so they killed JFK for being Irish. They killed. Did they kill RFK for being Irish as well? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Um, and then, <laughs> and then what they killed Martin Luther King for also being a person of color. Right. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. It was like, so, I mean, I've been reading a little bit about uh, JFK. I'm kind of uh, agnostic on the whole thing. I don't, I don't know for sure that the CIA did it, but, mm-hmm. I mean, it would make sense. And mm-hmm. I think there's some evidence. Mm-hmm. Like, so, President Bush Sr. Mm-hmm. was in the CIA at the time, 1963. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was He was actually in Dallas, and he's never really been able to explain why. He said he was giving a speech to a Rotary Club at the time. Mm-hmm. Um but apparently J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director at the time, has a memo where he said on the day of the Kennedy assassination that he briefed George Bush from the CIA about the reaction of the uh, Cuban exile community in Miami to the JFK assassination. Uh-huh. Um, so that's just like, it's just one of these weird historical things. And then, you know, you have a bunch of like kind of mafia guys in the Dallas area who are meeting with people we know to be CIA agents. And sure. then you you have all these Cuban exiles who, you know, of course, they uh, they hate Castro and the CIA uses them for a bunch of different things, including, you know, later in the 80s in Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. A lot of the people involved in that operation are, are Cuban exiles. So there's just a bunch of like smoke where I, I think it's certainly possible. And of course, you know, JFK fired uh, Alan Dulles was the... Uh, Okay. Kind of the most powerful original founder of this, or original head of the CIA. Right. Um, there were two Dulles brothers, right? Yeah, yeah. The other one was the Secretary of State for Eisenhower, okay. and Alan Dulles was the CIA director. So they basically ran U.S. foreign policy throughout the 1950s. Okay. What happened after JFK fired Alan Dulles? So um, some other guy I'm spacing on the name of, he, t- he took over, but the, the idea, and it, this is like... It's controversial. Like Noam Chomsky says, you know, JFK wasn't really going to change anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then there's like this other book that I'm going through and, you know, other people make the argument um, that JFK was going to, he uh, tried to cut the CIA's budget by 20%. He had some memorandum about the CIA cannot engage in any military operations anymore. Okay. Uh, You know, that's like only the Pentagon can do that. Right. Again, it's con- contentious. He might have been going to withdraw from Vietnam. We mm-hmm. don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, and, you know, he, like, was engaged in... It's kind of weird with JFK where he wanted to negotiate with uh, Khrushchev of the Soviet Union, and he actually reached out right before he died to Fidel Castro of Cuba. Mm-hmm. But he would reach out through these back channels, like journalists and stuff. He wouldn't use his own State Department because he didn't trust his own State Department because, you know, like you said, the other... D- Dull, Dulles brother was running it, so right. he had all the the career people were his his people. So right. JFK didn't trust them. Right. So it so, wasn't until twenty. Know, it, it, so it wasn't until twenty seventeen when the State Department was defeated by Donald Trump. Yes. When someone finally yeah. stuck it to those guys. That's what, like, I don't know. I, if I could get in a room with Donald Trump, I would just ask, like, you. I would just make the elevator pitch for him to go on TV and say. We're gonna shut down the CIA because it's all Obama loyalists. Uh-huh. Like, because only good things could happen from there. Yeah. Like, either he somehow gets it done, or you know they're gonna fly him to Dallas the next day. Yeah. That's a crazy thing because I heard somebody talk about. There was some interview with, with, with Jimmy Carter, and they were like, "Hey, when you become president, did they like tell you a bunch of secrets?" And he was like, "Yup." And they were like, "Can you tell us any?" And he was like, "No." <laughs> But it's just I it's I don't know. It's weird to think with Trump if he knows about a lot of that stuff or if they just kept it quiet from him. I, I don't know. It's 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 a tough thing to like wrap your head around, right? Where you're like, how much power do these people really have and then how much power does he have and what's when you get into the little details of, of the inner workings, you know? It's I it's it's definitely something that that I think you kinda have to piece together yourself, right? Yeah. No, there's like, I mean, there's another conspiracy that Obama's like CIA because I guess his mm-hmm. mom worked for USAID or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I've I've heard people speculate that when Trump was like 
dropping all those hints about, oh, hey, we don't know where Obama really came from or, you know, about the birther stuff yeah. that like he kind of dropped it because eventually they realized, oh, he's CIA. We're not allowed to touch that. Right. I don't know how true that is, but, uh, you know. Yeah. Interesting. Um, there's an Instagram account. I don't want to say exactly who it is, but you'll probably figure out who I'm talking about. And it's like the whole theme of the account is like positivity. Mm -hmm. So it's always like, oh, look at this. Like the, the, uh, a, a Home Depot employee with no legs was walking to work every day. And then the Home, and home Depot got him a scooter. And I just think that maybe this, this particular Instagram account might be CIA. Yeah. Right? No, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, they, uh, I feel like, like, at least with the left, they don't really have to do anything anymore. Like, mm -hmm. they just set it all up in the 80s, so that, you know, like, mm -hmm. y the, you, the, the, the left will just destroy itself continuously, so now they're probably more worried about the right. Uh -huh. Like, they probably have, you know, like, some of these bodybuilder accounts who are, like, fascists, I think, are probably CIA agents. Because you've got to you've got to steer, uh, you as all mm -hmm. these different, you know, kind of people who are marginalized from society will draw to different ideologies. You know, some right. of them become socialists or whatever, right. and that's like you know that's fine, that's contained. But then some of them are becoming you know fascists or white nationalists or or even you know this uh, dark enlightenment. There's a, there's a million different things, but I think the idea is like as soon as any of it's a threat to multinational corporations that's mm -hmm. when it's a problem right so i think that's why you probably have cia bodybuilders now because they're worried they're trying to keep the bodybuilders in favor of capitalism i think that's the highest priority sure yeah and it was funny because that documentary that you sent me so like in the beginning of the documentary they say something about like you know when 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 there's when there's war in different countries and when there's like, you know, communist uprisings, it's beneficial for the U S to back, you know, like certain drug runners because it, because if they're at war with the communists, it's like beneficial for us. And it's just so weird to me that like all these people, these people get jobs at a, at a place like the CIA and they go, Oh yeah, I'm like fighting against com like communism just becomes this sort of like, uh, this, like this boogeyman, you know? And uh, they're able to rationalize a lot of pretty awful shit. Right. And, you know, it's interesting because, of course, uh, when the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, like, they don't have that for a little while. But mm -hmm. then 9-11 happens, and, okay, it's terrorism. You uh -huh. get to do the exact same thing with terrorism. Right. As long as you're fighting terrorism, you can do whatever. Right. So, you know, a lot of the allegations of kind of the CIA probably if not aligning with the mexican drug cartels or whatever drug cartel they're certainly trying to manage and control the drug trade sure. and make sure okay these people are helping us out against terrorism so sure. we maybe look the other way on this or that right why didn't they have it after the soviet union collapsed well because you know i mean it's like you said when it came to like fighting communism um Different presidents were more and less adamant about this, but the okay. CIA is like a, a deep state agency. So mm -hmm. their entire mission is, you know, prevent communism uh, from spreading into these other different countries. So sure. uh, like the, the documentary you're talking about is the frontline documentary, um, Drugs, Guns, Money in the CIA or Drugs, Guns in the CIA. Mm -hmm. um, but they talk about around the same time of, as the Vietnam War, there was a civil war in Laos, mm -hmm. and there was like a communist insurgency, and then there was the CIA-backed faction, and they happened to, you know, in order to fund it, they uh, the CIA-backed faction was, you know, harvesting opium poppies, and then the CIA mm -hmm. was letting them use their Air America planes to fly them and sell them. Right. And... You know, I, obviously drug money is good for off-the-book operations, but, you know, there's people think uh, Jeffrey Epstein's, you know, child sex blackmail operation is another way to get off-the-book money. Um, sure. Gun running is another way. Yeah. Just any sort of, like, illegal activity, uh, the CIA can use those funds, or any intelligence agency can use those funds and not have to be responsible to, to Congress to get money for it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, like, because you start to think about Epstein and 
that does kind of make sense. I mean, that is the easiest way to like blackmail somebody, right? You just get mm-hmm. some horny, or you just get some teenager. You get them to think that some teenager wants to have sex with them, right. and then you go, "Oh, by the way, yeah, she wasn't. She wasn't nineteen. She was 14. I mean, how else do you, how else do you get somebody? You know, how else do you get somebody in a trap like that? Right. I mean, I think that's like the the weakness of a lot of people and actually so on the on grub stakers our podcast we did this three-part episode about the um the bank of credit and commerce international Mm -hmm. which was like this cia connected bank it was originally set up in pakistan in 1972 Mm -hmm. but it became like this massive fraud uh you know like it's like a 20 it was at at one time the seventh largest bank in the world it yeah. uh, gets indicted and it collapses in 1991 uh-huh. but uh my point here is they had their own intelligence department like this mm-hmm. nominal bank had like these agents mm-hmm. who allegedly according to like these journalists who wrote a book about it uh these bcci agents were doing assassinations for the cia mm-hmm. but also doing these kind of pedophile blackmail operations right and that kind of all comes back together where again this is only alleged in the book uh the outlaw bank by jonathan Beatty and sc gwynn but these two people were uh time magazine reporters they wrote a uh, a lot about this these are not like fringe conspiracy theory guys Mm -hmm. but basically this bcci guy says you know yeah we were doing these child sex uh blackmail operations to politicians from around the globe, but one person that they named was uh, in the U.S., uh, a guy named Senator John Tower, who was a Texas senator. He later died in a plane crash. Mm -hmm. But he's actually the guy who wrote the original Iran-Contra report for the U.S. government. Right. So that's just kind of weird where it's like, okay, this original report on Iran-Contra, this investigation is done by this guy who has allegedly been blackmailed by this CIA-connected bank (laughs) uh because he was raping a child supposedly (laughs) so you know there's there's just these kind of like connections everywhere if you if you look for them right it's almost like if you if you're gonna take these people on it's like you gotta just jack off before you leave your house i think i think that's the only way to fight (laughs) these these forces of evil right you know because like when they present you with a 13 year old uh pakistani lahore dancing girl like What man or woman or right. any gender really could could say no to that? Right. So when you see a terrified, starving child. <laughs> you just have to rape. <laughs> but no, but I mean, I feel like it's probably. I don't know. There's got to be a way that they do it. I mean, they probably present it as. I don't know. They probably present it as like, oh, this. They either tell them that these girls are not underage. Or they present it as like, oh, yeah, but she's like, she's cool, you know? Right. Because I feel like a lot of these people, they probably didn't get, they probably didn't uh, have sex in high school. So they're like, oh, I never got to, you know, I never got to, I I missed out on that. So let me just get like one, let me just get one teenager in and that's it. And I'll never do it again. And then before you know it, you're blackmailed. Right. Right. Yeah, like, well, it's interesting, like, just to go back to BCCI for a second, because mm. they, uh, they the probably bank. have, yeah, that's the bank. So they have different customs for, for different officials. But uh, why well, I mentioned BCCI is, so like I said, it's set up in 1972 by this Pakistani guy. Mm-hmm. The, the way he gets, it's originally funded with like kind of Pakistani heroin money. Mm-hmm. But the way he really takes off is because in the 1970s, there's this uh, huge spike in the price of oil Mm -hmm. so this is what makes all the saudi arabians uh all the guys in the united arab emirates so rich is in Mm -hmm. the 1970s oil prices spike okay um so this guy who founded bcci he actually goes out to the um uh the leader of the united arab emirates Mm -hmm. in like the late 60s Mm -hmm. and he says he says, instead of using these Western banks, why don't you use me? Why don't you use uh, a Muslim bank? Right. So this, the leader of the United Arab Emirates sets up with BCCI, and then when oil prices explode, they become um, very rich. Right. But basically why I'm, I'm bringing all this up is because before 
this guy becomes a billionaire, the leader of the United Arab Emirates, uh-huh. he was like a fucking fucking Bedouin, uh-huh. you know, like he was just uh, riding around on horseback and, you know, raiding other tribes. And then right. suddenly after World War II, the guy's a fucking billionaire. Right. So what BCCI would do to entertain this guy, and now his son is the guy who runs the, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh-huh. but um, to entertain this guy, his son, and the other officials from the United Arab Emirates, they would fly them out to Pakistan, and they would go to uh, the city of Lahore, mm-hmm. and they would go to the diamond market, mm-hmm. and they would find these dancing girls. Mm-hmm. And these girls would be like, you know, nine or 13 or oh whatever boy. the fuck. Yeah. But it would basically just be like poor children in Pakistan, mm-hmm. and then they would send out, BCCI would send out people to like pick them up, say, hey, here's X amount of money, and then we'll take you to the shop and buy you all these clothes, and then, oh, hey, you're going to go see the Sheik tonight. And you're a fucking starving child. You don't have any choice in the matter. Sure. Um, and Your father's so I guess like, what, what I was, a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, like, yeah, when they're pitching it to, like, the Sheiks in the uh, United Arab Emirates, it's probably different than that when they're pitching it to, like, some awkward high schooler uh, sure. senator sure. in the United States. Sure, so sure. They, they learned the, the different uh, reputational managements. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is interesting, like, uh, you know, John Kerry actually wrote the original report about this. You can you can read it for the U.S. Senate, mm-hmm. but he wrote about, you know, these dancing girls, like one of them was, like, uh, physically damaged by being um, uh, raped by these uh, uh, UAE officials. Nice. Um yeah, so, you know, just not to get too grim, I just, I don't want people to think this is like a fucking conspiracy theory. Like, right. all this stuff is in official documents from, uh, you know, the early 90s. Yeah, maybe that's the hardest part about people not wanting to believe it, is that they, they the, or maybe that's why people are so resistant to it, because you were supposed to think that the people that are in charge are like, you know, more be- more benevolent, more intelligent than we are. And it would it would kind of fuck with your head to think that they were you know just raping kids right i mean i think it's like in order to like be allowed on television you have to forget everything that happened a week before Mm -hmm. you know so i think like people who spend all day watching like cnn or msnbc end up being like far more misinformed yeah because you know it's like we just had what a four and a half trillion dollar bailout of of Wall Street, and then you just never heard anything about it again after that week. Now right. it's like, okay, we've moved on to the next news cycle. Yeah, that doesn't matter anymore. It's not like these people are still spending all that money, you know? Yeah. Is there any part of you that's like, oh man, I could be one of those people. I could just be watching MSNBC. I could I could forget about all this, but I guess you're too far down the uh, down the rabbit hole. Yeah, no, I wouldn't mind going back. I feel like if I if I did, I would just give up on politics entirely and mm-hmm. just like play farming simulator, and sure. like I'd have a fantasy baseball team, and you know, sure, because that's like, you know, like I watch baseball, but I just don't really know enough about it. So you know, like I'll be trying to have a conversation with somebody, and like I can fake it for like five minutes, and mm-hmm. then I'm just exposed that I'm just like. <laughs> an idiot who just doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about. Right. Cause right. I waste all my time reading about dumb shit for my, uh, podcast about billionaires. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. You want to talk about Nicaragua a little bit? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and, yeah. So the documentary right. you sent me, you said that the, there, they said that the CIA was backing the Contras in Nicaragua. So Nicaragua, the Iran Contra thing that was in the, or that was in the, 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 so the Sandinistas, the Sandinistas were in charge of Nicaragua, right? Mm-hmm. And then the Contras right. were like a right wing. Because I, I watched, I watched Predator recently, and the whole premise mm-hmm. of Predator is that like Arnold's elite team is going into the jungle with Carl Weathers, who's CIA, and they're going to like find these, uh, they got to like deal with these rebels who were, who captured some U.S. soldiers. Right. They're, and, yeah, they're going to. Tape the predator raping a thirteen-year-old girl. <laughs> that's how they and blackmail that's how they, the predator. <laughs> that's how they defeat the predator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this looks. This sounds like a job for Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, predator, is this you? And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> What would happen? If, <laughs> what yeah. would happen if the queen who laid you saw this tape, predator? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
<laughs> what would your spider mother think about this? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, but it's kind of funny. So it's like, oh, they're like, oh, we're going to, you know, like we got to defeat these rebels. And I think the, the rebels are like communists. But I guess what that was, was technically, I mean, if you were going to tell that story, honestly, the rebels would be just like farmers who want it, who don't, who, who want like a, an eight hour work day or like a 10 hour work day. Right. Like there's this narrative right. of, yeah, like bad, these like bad communists. There's this. There's always this narrative of like, uh, like that somehow, communism is oppressive. Right. Well, that's like you know, kind of when the. It rules. Uh, it rules. Right. Yeah. You know, it's great to to kill landlords and uh, small farm holders. Yeah. Race on these <laughs> for for hiding their <laughs> hiding their grain from you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like anybody. Anybody who says they wouldn't play that video game where you get to, like, execute, like, some fucking Russian farmer for not turning over their grain to you, I think is lying. Oh, is that a game? But, no, it's a, I, It's just my idea for a video game. Oh, okay. Would be you go and... Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, it's like, look, if you're some fucking serf, mm-hmm. it's undeniable that it would be awesome to kill everybody who makes your life miserable. And every now and then there's, like, a revolution and you get to do it. So mm-hmm. uh, we, right. we shouldn't be jealous that people get to live their dreams. Right. right. But um, is it a little, like, yeah, mind-boggling to think that, like, we've we've just fucked around in so many different countries and we've we've... And we have a pretty good record, it seems like. Well, it's something that, like, you know, on one level, it, it does bother me in the sense that there's there's a real transition point in terms of U.S. intervention before and after the CIA. Mm-hmm. Because, okay. you know, obviously, we did all the Manifest Destiny genocide, and, you know, we intervened in the, in the Philippines in, in 1898. Right. right. But there was, like, public opposition. Mm-hmm. You know, like, for example, in the Philippines, Mark Twain was one of the founders of the uh, the Anti-Imperialist League. And there was like, you know, public protest against against this stuff. But kind of what happens with the CIA is that suddenly we're, like I said, overthrowing governments in Iran, uh, mm-hmm. Guatemala. We're funding, you know, mass murder, uh, uh, genocide in Guatemala, mass murder in Nicaragua, El Salvador. Right. Um, you know, and on and on. And suddenly the public ha- doesn't even know. Like, yeah. they have no idea that the government is involved in all this bullshit around the world and mm-hmm. creating all these problems for us. And so, I mean, that's kind of, I think, the real change point. And I think it's very unfortunate where you have all these people who hate us and all these people who just had their lives ruined with the American public being completely in the dark sure. about, you know, everything that, that went on. Sure. And people don't know because it's just not reported? Right. Well, it's, you know, a state secret. So, sure. like, uh, the fact that the CIA overthrew the government in Iran in 1953, uh-huh. I believe that didn't come out until after Watergate. They have, mm-hmm. like, the Church Committee investigations into the CIA. So it's like you just don't even know your government is starting a war somewhere until 20 years after it's already concluded, you know? Sure. And that's kind of what's going on with Afghanistan now, where, like, right. there's rumors the CIA might be involved in, you know, like, again, child trafficking, because there's all these warlords, like, you know, molesting little boys over there and <laughs> right. uh, running heroin. <laughs> right. So there's rumors the CIA will be involved in that, but you don't know until, like, 20 years later the declassified papers are going to come out, and you're like, oh, I wish I would have known that at the time. Maybe I could have done something about it. Yeah, but that's the crazy thing when they interview some of these guys. It's just like they just look like somebody's dad, you know? <laughs> and I guess they think they're doing the right thing. But I but I think there's also this weird rationalization where it's like, look, this is just like the reality. We're just dealing with we're de- we're doing this. We're working within the system. We're using we're dealing with the world as it is, you know? Mm. Like they're like, there's nothing we can do about it. We have to traffic those kids. But that's a crazy thing about Afghanistan too. I mean, I, right? Like some report came out. Some report came out recently that said that Afghanistan. Uh, we, the report basically said in so many words that we never knew what we were doing there. And Afghanistan was supposed to be like the good war, the war that was like, no, I support that. No, I'm not a, I'm not a homosexual. I support the <laughs> Afghanistan war. I just don't right. support the Iraq war. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, no. I mean, it's like the thing to do there, if if you believe in it, would have been to just knock over the Taliban and get the Taliban and get the fuck out. Mm -hmm. You know, like don't stay more than a month. But yeah, it's like Let yeah, them it so. Out. Right. Well, we go in and suddenly it's uh, a bonanza for weapons contracts and, you know, the Carlisle Group and whoever else, uh -huh. Lockheed Martin, all the big five weapons co uh, defense contractors. And so, you know, now you have like a 20 year war where basically the various uh, people's longstanding grudges they were using the U.S. or the U.K. military to solve them. They were just saying, like, yeah, those guys over there are Taliban. Go blow the shit out of them. Okay. And then suddenly we go blow the shit. We have no idea. We go blow the shit out of them. And then right. it's like, oh, now we have a bunch of enemies right. because we just killed a bunch of people over here. Right. And then we kill a bunch of people over here. And now we have a bunch of enemies over here. And it's just been like, you know, we've been essentially fighting both sides of a civil war for 20 years now yeah. and propping up like we said, a, a heroin trafficking, you know, child raping government. Sure. And we're like, we trusted you. You said that guy was <laughs> Al Qaeda and we blew up his <laughs> we blew up his farm. Right. And now we, you're telling me he's not. Yeah. We dropped like an entire education's budget worth of bombs on this guy. <laughs> right. On your word alone. <laughs> and you're gonna right. You're going to mess me over <laughs> like this. We could have bought every homeless person a Ford Escape, and we just <laughs> <laughs> we just bought explosives. Not like yeah. a really nice car, like a, like a 2013 Ford Escape. Right. Like a utility vehicle. Yeah. A, a good second car. Yeah. That was another thing. You know, you know I'm glad I keep coming back to this, because that was another thing I, I talked to my mom about today. My mom was like... You know, people are getting the stimulus money, and like some people didn't even need it. And I'm I'm surprised that people even cash those checks. And it's just like you look at like the fucking defense budget and corporations that get bailed out, and I'm just like, mm. what the f what are you even saying? It's weird right. that people are so conditioned to just be so cucked for this rotten system. Well, yeah, I think it's cable news. I mean, I don't uh, like yeah. like I said again about. 4.5 trillion for Wall Street. Like, that's just not mentioned once. But mm -hmm. it's like, oh, yeah, the stimulus checks, $1,200 that somebody's going to pay, like, half their rent with. Right. You know. Uh, right. And then, like, the un unemployment benefits. Like, well, if people are making more on unemployment than they are at a job, the job should just pay more, you know. Yeah. But people yeah, act yeah. like, oh, these are sponges for not working for seven twenty five an hour. I know. That rules. When people are like, uh, oh, they get more, yeah, from unemployment. Um, yeah. Oh, but uh, Nicaragua you wanted to talk about? Um, yeah, I guess just kind of like, I mean, because I remember, I remember studying it in school and, and just it was like a little footnote in history class. But you don't really get into the, because I just feel like no nobody, nobody really... I mean, very few people know like the details and the and the minutia of of these things. But so I guess Nicaragua had a leftist government, and then I guess my question is like, who who were the Contras? Well, so Nicaragua had a uh, right wing U.S. backed military government led by a guy named Somoza, mm -hmm. and then this was overthrown by a leftist uprising, mm -hmm. uh, the Sandinistas. So yeah, now they have this Sandinista government and then the Contras were kind of like um, right-wing counter-revolutionaries, mm -hmm. uh, militant terrorists who, you know, again, uh, killed, ch raped children, all sorts right. of human rights violations you can look up. Right. But the Congress, the U.S. Congress in the 80s, uh, passed a law saying the Reagan administration could not send any more aid to the Contras because these human rights violations were coming out. Uh -huh. um, and so the CIA s sets up Iran-Contra where they're selling weapons to Iran, mm -hmm. they're taking the money and they're giving it to the Contras as well as at minimum looking the other way at the fact that the Contras are running drugs into the United States. Right. Um, and so, you know, like, and then this is uh, later on Gary Webb, the, the reporter who later died. He came out in 1996 with this article, this series of articles looking at the crack ep epidemic in Los Angeles uh -huh. and how 
uh, you know, Freeway Rick Ross was a, a major drug dealer in Los Angeles who was buying his cocaine from a uh, da- uh, Daniel Blendone, was a former official in the right-wing government that was overthrown, who later became a CIA-backed drug runner. Uh-huh. So this guy, you know, uh, Rick Ross was selling like a million dollars worth of cocaine a day in Los Angeles, and he was his supplier was at minimum connected to the CIA, if not directly a CIA employee. Mm-hmm. And Gary Webb's cause of death was suicide, it looks like. Right. Like, and, you know, a lot of people think he was murdered. Um, mm-hmm. It's possible. I don't know for sure. But, um, but you know, like people, again, they dismiss, oh, the CIA created the crack ad- epidemic mm-hmm. um, as a conspiracy theory. But, you know, even um, John Kerry, who also investigated this, like basically admitted it at the time, mm-hmm. you know, like I have this quote from an Al Jazeera article, uh, there is no question in my mind that the people affiliated with or on the payroll of the CIA were involved in drug trafficking, unquote. That's yeah. Senator John Kerry in the in the 1990s. Right. So, you know, again, all this shit just gets thrown by the wayside and you're like a kook if you fucking talking about talk about it, but it all really happened. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess it's easy to put this stuff to bed. I mean, it's yeah. easy to just, you know, I don't know. Right. Um and then I was reading something else about some some operation. Oh, there is something called like Operation Fast and Furious where they were like right. selling they were selling guns to Mexican drug cartels in hopes they could trace the guns and then they like lost like 1700 weapons or something. Right. Do you know anything about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean so there's like the Al Jazeera article I quoted from. It was a uh, the title is Mexican official CIA quote unquote manages drug trade, mm-hmm. and this was like an official for um, the Mexican a spokesman for the Mexican state of uh, Chihuahua mm-hmm. uh, that's on the border with uh, Texas. He said the CIA they don't fight drug traffickers; they try to manage the drug trade. Right. Um, and then he he does cite. Um, Operation Fast and Furious is an example, which is, I mean, it's basically what you said there. The CIA um, and the DEA, or no, the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms sold like 1,700 drugs to the cartel, or 1,700 guns to the cartels, Uh and uh, they lost track, and then an AK-47 was used in the 2010 murder of a uh, Customs and Border Protection agent, Right. one of the guns they had sold to them. Right. And, you know, this is kind of like... emblematic of a wider phenomenon but uh, but i guess it's like i think people should understand how much of you know the ar-15s and uh other guns that are sold in the united states legally just end up in mexico and get used by cartels to like kill their enemies you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's like that i mean that's kind of a drop in the bucket example of it but you know that's there's kind of a two-way street when it comes to trade illicit trade between the U.S. and Mexico where they send us, you know, cocaine or meth or heroin or whatever over the border, and we send back guns right. for the cartels and other vigilante groups. Right. Right, and I guess it's not in their interest to stop those uh, drug trades. Right. I mean, it's like they at least manage it where, um, you know— uh, well, just to kind of like continue on the Nicaragua thing, um, if you watch Narcos season one or Narcos Mexico season one, I think they could do a good um, job explaining kind of what happened. But basically with the Iran-Contra, the reason it got shut down and it got exposed is one of the CIA's pilots um, was shot down over Nicaragua and mm-hmm. then he had all these documents on him mm-hmm. uh, that kind of exposed the plan. So suddenly they couldn't, uh run guns in the in the usual way they were on a lot of scrutiny Mm -hmm. so actually the cia after like 86 switched over to using the mexican guadalajara cartel Uh was kind of the the existing drug cartel at the time they switched over to using them to like train the contras in uh, guadalajara cartel facilities Uh and you know kind of kind of what happens with all that is you end up at minimum looking the other way or doing favors for people who give who do favors for you if sure. you're the cia sure so you're like okay okay if you inform on me or help me out on this then i'll look the other way on this sure um and 
you know, like with regards to Mexico, another thing uh, that's covered in narcos and that's real is DFS was. So when the CIA is set up in 1947, there's also a Mexican agency called DFS, which is set up in 1947 and managed by the CIA, you know, in the initial creation stages. Mm -hmm. And the entire point of this, like, Mexican CIA is to prevent Mexico from becoming communist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, during uh, this period called the Mexican Dirty War, DFS is like... uh, carrying out assassinations, carrying out forced disappearances of, you know, student activists, labor union leaders, just anybody who's like a potential threat to the government. Jesus. But they also, right, but they also get involved in in the drug trade and, you know, illegal car carjacking rings and all these other sources of cash mm-hmm. because you've set up this like unaccountable lethal bureaucracy. Sure. So what happens is there's this DEA agent named Kiki Camarena, mm-hmm. and he he busts up this massive marijuana smuggling operation in like 85, 86, mm-hmm. uh, that both the Mexican and the U.S. government had been looking the other way on because the Mexican CIA was involved in it. Mm-hmm. So he busts it up, and then he gets kidnapped and tortured, and he gets like a power drill through his kneecap and all this shit, Jeez. and then he gets killed. Yeah. Um, and basically the scandal and the fallout are such that DFS, I mean, the only thing that happens to it is they have to rename it. So now it's called CNI, Uh but you know, it's officially disbanded and merged with another agency. Um, but it's relevant because in 2013, two former DEA agents and one former CIA contractor, uh, alleged to, um, a journalist that, the CIA was directly involved, or at least CIA employees were involved in kidnapping and killing this DEA agent. Right. So, you know, it's just like this kind of crazy thing where um, you have the CIA operating as a government within itself, setting its own foreign policy and making all these other decisions, including like fucking murdering DEA people who get in the way of their cash flow. Right, just like another, another like government agent, like a government employee. Just like another type of Fed, I, I guess. Right. It's yeah. Right, and that's what's so so impressive to me is like like we said they were created in 1947, and by like the 50s they've already taken over the fucking government. Like that's very, sure. that's a fast rise. Right. These these people got Conan at 21 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, is there anything, I mean, can you attribute that fast rise to anything? I mean, like, w- when you look back at the time that it was formed, um, like, what do you think happened? Well, you know, so there's, like, um, uh, there have been a lot of books written about the early history. I, I think I think it was just the general factors of the Cold War. Because, mm-hmm. like, you know, so you had... The U.S. won World War II, and now the U.S. and the Soviet Union are the two superpowers in the world. Mm -hmm. And at first, we thought we'd be able to cooperate with the Soviet Union, and then, you know, it became apparent that we that we couldn't. So Mm -hmm. the government needed information on the Soviet Union, and they didn't have any. So -hmm. they actually hired uh, a former Nazi spy named uh, Gielan, Mm -hmm. uh, and he had all these files on the Soviets of kind of dubious accuracy, but the CIA just said like, okay, we need this intelligence. We'll give you a bunch of money. You can set up this East German spy ring, Mm -hmm. um, the Gielan, the Gielan organization, Mm -hmm. and we'll rely on that. And so, I mean, kind of what happened was the U S government was blind and it kind of turned to the CIA to be like, okay, tell us everything, you know, learn about the Soviet union for us so we can understand them. Right. And also like, in the case of the 1953 coup in Iran, once you kind of set that off, that kind of became official U.S. policy is like, if there's a government that we don't like, we can have the CIA knock it over and nobody needs to know about it. So yeah. once you kind of empower them to do that, then they can even start their own wars, which is like kind of what people allege the Bay of Pigs is, where they uh-huh. try to bait John F. Kennedy into going to war with Cuba because they don't want to give up on on Cuba, you know? Yeah. So... I mean that's kind of a halfway explanation. There's there's certainly better, but I think it was just the the sudden suddenness of the Cold War and the realization that nobody knew anything about the Soviet Union. So they were the people who said, "Yeah, we can we can figure this shit out. We can we can take care of the Soviet Union for you." They had a can-do attitude. It was, 
Right. And, you know, the Dulles brothers were, were smart people, whatever else you want to say about them. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's weird to think that... So I guess the, the Bay of Pigs was just them kind of going over JFK's head to invade Cuba and thinking they were going to overthrow Castro. Right, because, like... I mean, and the Castro story is pretty fascinating because Castro, you know, he overthrows like a violent uh, repressive government Mm -hmm. and actually goes on a U.S. tour in 1959 where he has like massive adoring crowds throughout New York and he's like hugely popular. Mm -hmm. And he never at any point said he was a communist. But then he goes to the U.S. government and says, hey, uh, the previous government stole everything. Could I just get a little bit of aid money? Right. And the U.S. government says, no, no aid money. Yeah. So then he goes to the Soviet Union and then, you know, gets the aid money. And then the U.S. blockades him right. uh, for going to the Soviet Union. So the, the entire thing was so stupid. But, you know, the CIA had some connections with the mafia. And, of course, you know, the mafia was all involved in the previous Cuban government. Uh-huh. So the CIA wanted to put, like, a pliable gangster back in charge. Uh-huh. They wanted to get rid of Castro. So they set up this plan of uh, former Cuban exiles invading, mm-hmm. and they convinced JFK, like, yeah, the U.S. does not need to be involved in this at all. You mm-hmm. don't need to provide air support or troops or anything. Uh, okay. But the, ent- the entire time, like we know from declassified documents, they were saying, yeah, this is bullshit. We're going to commit to it, and then once it looks like it's going to go bad... We're going to make JFK commit to it because he's not going to want it to fail. You know, like it'll look bad if it blows up without U.S. support. And then JFK wouldn't commit air support to the Bay of Pigs. And so it failed. And then this is, you know, if you buy that he was assassinated by the CIA, this is kind of the turning point. Yeah. Wow. I guess it's just, uh, yeah, a bunch of stuff that we'll never really, we'll never really know (laughs) what's going on. Um, do you want to talk about Venezuela a little bit before we wrap up that the the coup attempt um, over there? Because it feels like like there's sort of this like it seems like the U.S. can just go in and t- topple any government that it wants, but maybe we're not as powerful as we think we are. Yeah, I mean. I think, like, the most recent one in Venice... It's interesting to me where, you know... I guess I get shit, but I think the reality of life and government is that whoever has guns is in charge, you know? Mm -hmm. Even Chairman Mao said this, power comes from the barrel of a gun. Right. So the entire thing that happened in Venezuela... I mean, you know, I can't go through the whole history, but, you know, this was a right-wing-supported government... And then Hugo Chavez was a um, Venezuelan military officer who was hunting down leftists and then kind of converted to becoming a socialist himself. Mm -hmm. He uh, tried to do a military coup, then he later got elected. Mm -hmm. And then there was, shortly after he was elected, there was a coup attempt against him. Mm -hmm. So what he set up was a massive program to bribe the Venezuelan military. Mm -hmm. The Venezuelan military, under this program that was set up by Chavez and continued under Maduro, they can access foreign exchange markets at preferable rates. Uh So just imagine you have this like worthless currency that the government will pay you to turn into dollars or euros at a subsidized rate. It's, you know, just literal bribery. You get your little bribery fund just for being like a loyal officer in the military. And that worked Mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, Obama and Trump did all these sanctions and they tried to have like an uprising, but all of the officers and most of the soldiers stayed loyal because the, Hugo Chavez set up a bribery program right. for the military. Right. So like ultimately, you know, like, and you look at Allende in Chile was another CIA overthrown guy. And uh-huh. this was because the CIA managed to get the military to do a coup against him. So the reality is if you can keep your local military on your side, they Uh can usually protect you from the CIA. Interesting. Right. Which is why I want, you know, Bernie Sanders to like get a bunch of disgruntled Afghan and uh, Iraq war veterans and start going on some, uh, you know, targeted campaigns against uh, internal enemies. Yeah. He won't do it though. He's too nice. Yeah. Unfortunately. But you know, he's like, He's really the only one who could, like, actually convince these people. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sure. What about Nina Turner? Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. 
All right, cool. Well, uh, anything else before we wrap up? Did uh, we miss anything? Did we get to everything you wanted to talk about? Let me just take a look at my notes here. Sorry, you can. Sorry yeah. about this. You can edit this no, out. No, please. No, we don't edit uh, anything out. All right. Give me one second. I'll call you right back. Sure. Fuck. Christ. Fucking stupid cock sucking fucking cell phone died. <laughs> Stop barking. Hello? Hey, I'm call it's me. I'm calling you from Deb's phone. My bad. All right, no worries. You can hear uh, me all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, was there anything anything else before we uh wrap up? Uh, I mean, I guess just to kind of summarize, I think it's interesting that, you know, the Iran Contra scandal, like you don't really hear much about it. Like you hear all about Watergate, but you don't really hear much about Iran Contra. Mm -hmm. And uh and I think that's partly because there's this entire, let's say you can call it the deep state, whatever you want. There's this blob that encompasses both parties. Right. So like, you know, William Barr, the current attorney general, he actually recommends that Bush senior pardon all these fucking Iran Contra guys uh -huh. uh, in the last days of his presidency, because one of them's about to go to trial and might testify against Bush senior. Right. Um, and then Bill Clinton comes in, and it just so happens that one of Bill Clinton's money guys is uh, this bank I mentioned earlier, BCCI. He's one of the people, uh, his name was Jackson Stevens. He was like a, a millionaire Arkansas funder of Bill Clinton's, and mm -hmm. he was one of the people who brought BCCI into the United States. Mm -hmm. BCCI was making loans to Jimmy Carter. Um, the CIA had William Casey under um, Ronald Reagan was meeting directly with the head of BCCI on mm -hmm. a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like what I'm getting at here is like Watergate, you learn all about because actually, according to the book, The Devil's Chessboard, mm -hmm. Nixon threatened the CIA head that they would expose the quote unquote Bay of Pigs thing, which people <laughs> yeah. think was was a uh, a veiled threat to expose the CIA the role in the Kennedy assassination. Right. Um, but, you know, what I'm getting at here is like you hear all about Watergate because that guy pissed everybody off. Nixon pissed off the Republicans and the Democrats and all this shit. Sure. But then stuff like Iran-Contra kind of gets memory hold. And, mm -hmm. you know, you have Democrats talking about Reagan who was a decent man and all this shit. Mm -hmm. Because when it involves, you know, a powerful faction like the CIA or both political parties, it's better for everybody to forget it. And right. then the people who watch the CNN, MSNBC, they just, they never hear about this shit because it's only, oh, hey, what happened last week, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's also like it's very normalized too to just be like, oh yeah, we just back murderous, we topple governments and back genocidal regimes, and I don't know. It just seems like we sort of accept it. I think when they when they when they when you hear about it so much, and I think like especially living through Iraq and Afghanistan, there's almost a thing with our generation, right, where it's like we're kind of we're like glad it's over, yeah. right? Where like there's so there isn't. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is, but it does seem like this kind of stuff is very, uh, very normalized. Yeah. And, I, you know, like I, I think it is like I was saying with with the media where, you know, like people got mad at Bernie for like bringing up the Iraq war all the time. Like that's over. That's done. Yeah. Or, you know, like you talk about the coup in Iran. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, that was that was decades ago. That doesn't matter anymore. But it's like all this shit has ramifications for hundreds of years sure when you like overthrow a government somewhere like yeah the people of iran are gonna hate us and not trust us for a hundred fucking years it yeah it, it like you know so it is just something where the way you know punditry and the 24-hour news networks are set up and twitter and all this shit it's like okay what's today's news cycle like sure. you know 10 years ago doesn't fucking matter yeah there's always new stuff there's, there's always new uh New child rape allegations, for sure. Right. Yeah. There's always a, a new celebrity who said the a racial slur. Yeah. Well, Sean, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for inviting me. And, Good uh, talking with you. Yeah, you too. Guys, check out the Grub Stakers podcast. That's Sean's podcast where they, uh, they talk about billionaires. And uh, good show. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to, it is hard to piece together these, these, 
power structures and how this stuff works. But uh, we're in our 30s now, so we should know a little yeah. bit about a little bit more about what's going on. Right, but you know the important thing is like it doesn't matter. I could be learning uh, about baseball. It'll make the same amount of fucking difference for <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for changing anything in the world. These people are way yeah, above yeah. my fucking pay grade. Well, and you it'll only give you get a little, to do, I guess. Right? Yeah, it's a hobby. Yeah, like collecting magic cards or like something. Like collecting but, magic cards, you know. like Pokemon. Right. Yeah. Oh, I did forget. Like, so Trump says he's going to declassify the last of the JFK files in like October 2021, but maybe uh-huh. he'll push that back again. But it's just something where it's like they just keep pushing this back, uh-huh. and so it leaves a lot of questions. But you only get a small little piece of the elephant until all the files come out with uh, with anything the CIA or any of these organizations does. That's going to be such a weird thing, though, because it seems like all this stuff, there's a lot of reporting like this. There's these big reports, because I think that Afghanistan report, right, with like, like that was a big one. I feel like I could almost see in our lifetime... Someone being like, yeah, 9-11 was, was done by, uh, 9-11 was actually done by Sean Penn. And everyone just being right. like, oh, 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 okay. Oh, wow. That's, oh, okay. So that's what happened. Well, like, yeah, like there's clearly Saudi involvement in like 9-11 that was covered up. And it's like, yeah. nobody cares. And like, like you said about that big Afghanistan papers report, this was like a massive report uh-huh. that came out that proved that the government has like lying about this war and knew it wasn't winnable and continued it for 20 years. And then it's like a week later, it's gone. Yeah. Nobody talks about it anymore. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah. All right. You know, last well, thanks, week's news cycle. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here, Sean. All right, thanks, Mike. Take care of yourself yeah, and your you family. Too. Yeah, thanks. Say say hi to your mom for me. <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll tell her you said hi next time I see her. Yeah, yeah, I will. You should you should call her and talk some sense into her. Yeah. Stop watching CNN, Mister Seen. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Bye. Thanks, Sean. Bye.